In this video, I'll show how I replace a meeting rail, beginning with a quick review of the seven steps. First step is assessing conditions. I'll cover deteriorations like weather checks and old holes from hardware, and several others. Then, selecting wood that will be durable and long-lasting. Here I'm covering old growth Douglas fir and describing how the high annual growth ring count can give dense durable wood. Next step, measuring and accurately documenting the old meeting rail. Then onto the table saw to rip out rail stock. And then laying out the joints on the new rail stock. Now, shaping the joints, I found that using traditional hand tools and methods can be faster than setting up the machines, especially when there's just one or two joints to make. Here I'm using a back saw. and sharp chisel and a mallet to chop out the mortises. The result is a new joint. And then assembling that new rail into the old sash. and holding that joint together with wooden pegs, accurately locating the hole to hold the peg, and then how to set the peg in the hole. With handmade pegs like this, it can be important to recognize that the peg is not exactly square. It might have a longer dimension that needs to go in the direction of the grain of the rail so it doesn't split the wood of the rail. And then the fun part, just tap it in. Okay, that's the seven steps. Let's get on with the rourke. I'm working on this two light sash. I deglazed it, removing both panes of glass and all of the old putty and paint. Just taking a close look at the meeting rail here. And see that it's full of weather checks, which I could repair with wood epoxy repair methods. And There are two sets of meeting rail lock screw holes that could also be filled with the wood epoxy repair methods. And here's more weather checks right along the top of that rail. And over here at this end of the rail, there are some splits in the wood, three or four or five of them. A couple of them are pretty deep, 
And they come right out at the top of the meeting rail along here. I could glue those back down with wood epoxy repair methods too. Now I've removed the pins from the joints so I can take the rail out of the sash. And I can see that this tenon is also split up a little bit. It's pretty weak. So I could repair that tenon by cutting a new one, taking out the old tenon, cutting a slot back into the rail for the new tenon to fit into, and gluing that in place. But by the time I get all of those repairs done on this rail, I think it's going to take me more than a couple hours. So I've decided to just replace the whole rail with a new one made out of nice old growth wood. And here's a plank of that nice old growth wood. It's Douglas fir. And then along this side of the plank, there's some nice straight grain wood. So I'll just cut the stock for my new rail from that side of the plank, carefully avoiding these weather checks and splits along this side of the plank. And this big old knot right here. So I'll just cut that plank off about an inch longer than I need it. Here's the end of that same plank. I just wanted to show you how to recognize old growth wood that's so much better than new modern fast growth wood. Here on the end of the plank, you can see the annual growth rings. Go like this. And they're about one about every sixteenth of an inch. Like that. The heart of the tree was over here somewhere. Here's the annual growth rings. And over here by the side of the plank, growth rings are going from one side of the plank right over to the other side. Then a little further out, you can see the darker tan and the slighter cream color. Here, that sapwood. Now this heartwood has naturally decay resistant materials in it and the sapwood doesn't. So I'm going to avoid the sapwood when I cut my piece out of this plank. Now in contrast, here's a plank of modern new fast growth wood and it has two or three or four growth rings per inch. And this old plank of Douglas fir has, well, over here it has about 16 to 20 growth rings per inch. And over here, the tree was slowing down in growth and it has 30 or 40 growth rings per inch. And that makes the wood over here more stable than even this wood, and a lot more stable than this modern fast growth wood. So by comparison, this plank of fast growth wood is like cardboard junk. Won't use that in sash work. I'll take my cutting for the sash right out of here. Over here where there's 30 or 40 growth rings per inch, lots of stability and durability in this piece of wood. With some simple table saw work, I've roughed out a blank for the rail stock. I ripped off sapwood and ripped off a blank that's about a quarter of an inch wider than the rail. 
that allows for some movement if the stress in the plank is relieved by ripping this off. It can bow or curve a little bit, and I'll still have enough wood to get a nice straight rail out of it. There's still a little bit of nice tight old growth wood with 30 or 40 growth rings per inch here in the plank, so I'll save that for more repairs on other windows. Here we're looking at the end of the old rail, and I've cut it off. Take a close look at the orientation of the annual growth rings. Here you can see the growth rings are going right straight across like this. And that's one of the causes of this splitting on the bottom of the rail, these pieces splitting off, is a defect called ring check, where the wood has a weakness along the annual growth rings. It's not in every piece of wood, but common enough to have a specific name when it fails like that. So that was one of the causes of that splitting on the rail. The other defect on the rail was these weather checks. Splits in the surface of the wood that are caused by sun and moisture. And those, here's one of the deeper ones right here. And those happen when the annual growth rings are parallel to the surface of the wood. There's another structure within the wood that's called the medullary rays, and they rise vertically to the surface when you, the annual growth rings are going parallel to the surface. And where those medullary rays meet the surface, there's a little slight weakness. And as the wood expands and shrinks due to changes in moisture content from drying out in the sun and getting wet with water, little checks or cracks develop, and that's what the weather checks are. So it, it's easy to prevent weather checks by having the weathering surface so that the annual growth rings go perpendicular to the surface that weathers, top of the rail. So here, here's the old railing here with the ring checks and weather checks. So in my new railing, I'm careful to select my piece of wood so that the annual growth rings go across from the weathering surfaces. So the annual growth rings in this piece are oriented like this. And I'll cut my rail out of it like this. So that the weathering surface has the annual growth rings rising to that surface that'll prevent weather checks on the surface that's exposed to the sun and water. Shape the rail stock accurately, I begin by making a sketch of the profile and then measure the old rail with caliper to get its overall size. Here it's 1 and 11. 30 seconds by 1 and 3 sixteenths.
in the same way I record all of the detail measurements. Then at the bench saw, I rip down the blank into rail stock with just one, two, three, four, five cuts, and then one, two, three bevel cuts. This was pretty accurate table saw work. I try and work to 64th of an inch accuracy when I'm cutting window parts like this. This is the rail and style joint. It comes apart by sliding sideways like this. It won't come apart sliding this direction. You can see it's a little loose there and that's one of the reasons I decided to make a new rail was to tighten up that joint. But it won't slide open this way because this tenon is thicker here than it is here. And the slot that it fits into is thicker here than here to match. And that helps grip the rail so that it doesn't drift downward when the window sash is in service. So, here's the new rail stock. And there's two steps to cutting the joint. First, I'll lay it out with pencils and marking tools, and then I'll cut the joint. So the first step in layout is to take the end of the new rail and put it against the end of the old one and hold them both down on my flat workbench and then mark the cheeks of the tenons. We'll just mark that out. One there, the opposite cheek on that tenon. And then the cheek down below. Next, I've set the rail along the ends of the styles, and I'll copy the slope of this bevel. I'll do that with a board that I've cut square forming a right angle here and lay that board along the face of the rail then use my bevel holding the stock of the bevel along the end of the board and and setting my bevel to copy that angle. Then I'll lay the bevel holding the stock against the bottom edge of the rail. And mark that slope. Just like that. Next, I've laid the new rail down top up on the bench and the old rail on top of it. 
and I'll use a little square to align the faces of the rails with each other. And then I'll make sure that the end of the old rail is flush with the end of the new rail. That's it. I better check that face alignment again. Okay, then I'll hold the two together and mark out the position of the shoulders. The open shoulder and the interior shoulder. That's interesting because it's on a slope. Then I'll lay out the ends of the pin and cheeks on the end of the rail using a little square. Pretty straightforward. Next, I'll carry the squares of the joint around the rail. First, marking the shoulder here. the tri-square. Then I'll mark the sides of the tendon cheeks. And that can be done with a marking gauge Got this one rigged up with a little pencil in it. Next, I have to transfer the length of the side cheeks from the top of the rail to the bottom. And I easily do that with dividers. First setting the divider to record the length. and then transferring that to the bottom. Or with Vernier calipers. I usually have these on hand from making the rail stock. Recording the length there. And then marking it here. And then there's the angled bottom of that mortise. And the last step of layout is to just mark out which parts of the joint I'll be cutting away just so I don't. Cut off the wrong part of the joint. If I lay the old joint right next to it. And mark all the parts of the joint that I'll be cutting away.
Next is cutting the joint out, and it's four simple cuts. I'm using a back saw with fine teeth, probably uh, 15 teeth per inch. And then I'll use a coping saw to cut the bottom of the slot. And then one last cut on the shoulder. So that's it. The joint is complete. Now I'll just test the fit on it. The mutton bar here in the middle of the sash has a little short stub tenon on it and it needs a mortise cut in the rail. Here I've already laid out the mortise, and I'll show you now how I did that. First I set the new meeting rail along the top rail of the sash, and I butt the shoulder of the new joint up against the neck of the glazing rabbit. Then down here where the new rail passes over the mutton bar, I use my little tri-square to transfer the location of the side of the mutton bar onto the surface of the new rail. And I do the same over on the other side. And that locates the position of the mutton bar on the new rail. And then down here at the bottom end of the mutton bar, I use the tri-square to lay out the ends of the mortise according to the marks from up above. And 
and Vernier calipers to gauge the thickness of the tenon, and then lay out the side of the mortise using the points of the Vernier caliper like a marking gauge. Next is chopping out the mortise. I'm using a sharp chisel and a wooden mallet. And then as the last step, I'll just trim out the ends of the mortise to their final dimension. And that's it. All right, the rail is complete. All the joints are cut. Here's that mortise. And they're all looking just right. So now I'll assemble the rail into the dash. Now I can just spring the sash open enough to get that. Some sash might have to come apart to actually get the new rail in. So that's it. Sash is in place. And that new joint is looking pretty good. I think it's going to hold. Next step is to put new pins in there to hold the joint together. Now I've set up the sash with some clamps to draw the joint together. It doesn't take much pressure, but I like it nice and snug before I drill the hole and set the wooden pins. So just as a final check on squareness, I've got my carpenter's square handy. I'll just set that on this inner edge of the sash just to check squareness. It's nice and square. If it weren't square, I would pull it from this corner over to that one or from that corner over to that one out of the parallelogram it's until it's 
nice and square. But it's good now. So the next step is to lay out where I'm going to drill the hole. I want to have the hole over here close to this inner corner because I know that this piece of wood is going to expand and shrink with changes in moisture content and the wood in the rail will do the same thing, expand and shrink. And I want to hold the joint tight over here in the corner because that's where the glass and the putty and paint will be. And I don't want that to get stressed by this movement of the wood. So I'll put it near the corner and I like to go by the quarters when I place these pins in sash. So going across here, I figure there's half and there's a quarter. And going across here, here's half and here's a quarter. So I'll drill my hole with a pin right there. Now I've got my drill set up with a 3 16 inch bit and I put a stop collar on it that's held in place with a set screw. And I've set that to just 1 8 inch shy of the thickness of the rail over here so that it won't drill all the way through. I always set my sash pins from the in interior side because if they go through to the exterior, it can let moisture in if it if the paint or putty that fills it fails. So just to uh, keep the weather envelope on the outside of the sash intact, I drill the hole from the inside. So pretty straightforward. Just drill the hole. And then I can set the pin. Now the pin might be a little thicker this way than this way. So I always put the thicker dimension in line with the grain. If I put it across the grain, it might tend to split the wood here at the surface. So I'm going to put this longer dimension with the grain. and then just tap it in place with a hammer. So that's pretty good. Just one more to do at the mutton bar joint and another one over at the style and rail joint over on the other side. So when I get that done, the rail renewal is complete. To review and wrap up the rail renewal, the old rail had several problems from broken and rotting out tenons to heart checks that were splitting up on the bottom side. and weather checks all along the top of the old rail, as well as old holes from past latches and nail holes from poor previous repairs. So I made a new rail and it's looking all right. The joints came out nice and tight. So I think that's a railing that's going to last for quite a while.